say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city. We shall die there. If we sit still here, we die also. Come, let us fall under the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. And they rose in the twilight to go under the camp of the Syrians, and when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots, of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and of the Egyptians. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. When these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried thence silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again, entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. Then they said one to another, We do not well. This day is a day of good tidings and we hold our peace. You may be seated. The key verse that I call your attention to is that question, why sit we here until we die? The setting for this lesson tonight is the cruelty of ancient war. The uh, city of Samaria is surrounded by the Syrians. It's been surrounded for some time, and uh, the siege has been very heavy. Before atomic bombs and diving planes and uh, modern weapons, cities were conquered by siege, that is. They drew a circle of men and steel around a city, cut off its water and food supply, and waited for the people to become emaciated and poor, to be starved out, until eventually they'd put up the white flag, open the gates, and come out many times so, so weak and devastated they could hardly stand. In this lesson, we have a city under siege, and we have the Syrians throwing the iron ring around the town. Outside of the wall of that city are four leprous men. They're outside the city because they're lepers. They're ugly, repulsive. They're suffering from the fatal malady, and uh, they will eventually die. Lepers must cry unclean, unclean, unclean when anyone would approach them. They were despised and hated and abominated and only lived by the sufferance of the people who would go in and out of the city gate from time to time, who would throw them a coin or a piece of flesh, a chunk of fruit, or they would scavenge in the garbage and make their living as best they could. But the city's been shut up for days, so they've had nothing to eat. They're under the broiling sun by day and the bitter, chilling night. Winds howl about them and buffet them, and they huddle together in their misery and their aching backs and their empty stomachs and their minds are confused by it all. Ancient war was cruel, like all war is cruel. And reading the communiques that came from the battlefield today, my heart was deeply touched, almost to tears, when I saw pictures in the paper or in the news magazines and read about the devastation that is being wrecked upon the Arabs at the present time. Regardless of what your feelings are, you and I naturally must sympathize with those who are in such sorrowed boys and girls and children mangled and torn and shredded for life caught in the ravage of war these leprous men were caught in the ravage of war things were really bad in the town not only were they bad outside the city where the lepers were at but things are really bad inside people were starving inside the city if you want to get a picture of the ravages of that kind of war read the preceding chapter chapter 6 they got to the place where they didn't have anything to eat. 
They didn't have a cat or a rat or a dog or a frog or a lizard or a toad, anything that would jump or crawl or run. A bird that was, uh, could be possibly caught anything and everything was eaten. As a matter of fact, they were eating donkeys. As a matter of fact, it says an ass's head was full, sold for four score or 80 pieces of silver. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to eat a mule even if he was fat. But to eat, uh, to eat one, just eat his head. Just get an ass's head, an old Missouri mule, bony, gristly. A mule doesn't have much brains, but uh, I wouldn't want to eat a mule brains and all. They took a mule's head after they'd eaten mule steaks and mule roasts and all the other things associated with mules after all of that. They'd eaten everything around the hoofs and around the tail and are, now they've got the head, they're eating anything around the snout and everything around the ears. Did you ever try chewing on a pickled uh, mule's ear for a while? That's worse than pig snout. It's a bad way to go. How do you know? Well, I don't know because I've tried it, but I, I've read this lesson. It sounds bad. They'd put the old mule's head in something and they'd broil it and boil it and then they'd take it out and they'd eat the eyes and eat the brains and, and uh, they'd scrape off all the hair and they weren't too fussy about that and there really wasn't all that much to eat either. And they were eating uh, asses' heads, paying a good penny for them too. But things were worse than that. There were two women in that city. Maybe their husbands were caught in the siege. Maybe their husbands were dead, but there were two women. Maybe they had illegitimate children. I don't know, but there were two women, and each one had a baby. They didn't have any money. And they couldn't buy even an ass's head. They couldn't buy uh, calves of dove's dung. They had absolutely nothing. And one day while the children were bawling and squalling and whimpering and uh, these mothers' skinny, emaciated characters that they were were clutching these helpless little babes, one looked at the other and said, well, you know, we're not whipped yet. There's one thing we can still do. Well, what can we do? Well, we can eat our children. Oh, why, that's a terrible thought. Well, it is a terrible thought. But it's the kind of things you think when uh, you're isolated, when you're stranded, when circumstances are bad. A few years ago in the Andes Mountain, there was a plane crash, and the people that survived and got out of the crash and were eventually brought into civilization they eventually confessed that they ate passengers who were killed and they sliced the meat off from their limbs and off from their arms and lived as cannibals until they got to civilization. So they, uh, I don't know how they, how the first one they decided, maybe they drew lots, said, okay, it's your kid first. So they took the child, they probably strangled it, probably didn't take too much to choke off the lifeline because after all, the little fellow was nearly uh, emaciated and done in anyhow from malnutrition, but he, he dropped limp, and so they spent two or three days. They roasted part. They, uh, they broiled part. Uh, you say, this is grisly. Well, this is what the Bible says happened. How do you know it happened? Because it tells us here that when it came time to eat the next kid, why, uh, they couldn't find it. The mother had hidden the child. And so the mother, whose child had been devoured, saw the king walking around on the wall. And she said, oh, king, oh, king. He looked down and said, what do you want? She said, we had a bargain. The bargain was we'd eat my child, and then we'd eat hers. Our, my child is gone. We've eaten him. There isn't a bone or a crumb left. But she's hidden her child. We have nothing to eat. We're starving. She wanted the king to decide the issue. And the king had sackcloth on. He said, how in the world am I going to feed anybody? I have nothing to give. That's a picture of the, of the situation when these men outside the city wall. It was a desperate situation. There was no help inside the town. There was no help outside the town, apparently. And here they are caught in the squeeze. They're in the middle here. Here's the wall, and here's the Assyr Assyrians, and here are the lepers, and they're in the middle. And they ask themselves a question, well, why do we sit here until we die? And the gist of this lesson tonight is 
The gist of this lesson tonight is to bring you to a point of decision. There are some things, you know, that, uh, well, it's not really necessary to wait in judgment on some things. There are some things it's not hard to make our mind up about. If I said tonight, in this hold I hand I hold a diamond, and you can see it scintillate and spark, in this hold I hand I hold a stone, hold it up and you'd see its dull, rustic tones. I'd say, which would you rather have? You'll say, well, that's easy, I'll take the diamond. Why, of course you'd take the diamond. It doesn't take long to make up your mind. You know the value of a diamond. You know the lack of value in a stone. If I call these fine boys that I heard over in the shower tonight, I don't know, sound like they're going to be some preachers out of that shower crowd tonight. I call those shower boys that were in there tonight sort of trying to get cleaned up and look pretty for the girls. If they were here tonight, I imagine they're out here in the shadows somewhere. I'd say to those fellows, fellows, what would you rather have, a Corvette or a Chevette? Why, they wouldn't have to pray about it. They'd say, ah, we know what we want. We want the Corvette right away. I don't want that old Chevette. That thing won't hold together very long. Give me the Corvette with the 500 symbol on it and the chrome wheels and the stacks. That's my choice, not hard. Now, friend, there are some things it's not necessary to have an involved process and arrive at a conclusion. And salvation is another thing it's not difficult to come to a conclusion about. You're sitting out there tonight and you know the value of your soul to some measure. You know the benefits and the privileges and the blessings of salvation in some measure. In your heart of hearts, you have already decided that between heaven and hell, you choose heaven. Between light and darkness, you choose light. Between life and death, you choose life. You know that. That's a very, very simple deduction for you to make. You don't have to drive a car, that thing around the block to see whether it works. You don't have to take it out for a trial run of some kind. You know, as well as I do, that you are going to have to come to a decision about your eternal destiny. You know that. Brother uh, Floyd uh, Coates and myself were talking tonight, and he said, Brother Smool, how do you get people... Uh, how do you persuade people to give? I go in, I talk to a man, and I need money for my campaign, and he, I tell him my story, and instead of writing me a check for a thousand, which he's well able to do, he only writes me a check for a hundred. How do I persuade him? For the coach, I'd like to know how I can persuade people. I have more on my side than he has. I have people praying. I have people pulling. I have fathers. I have mothers. I have the Spirit of God working in this crowd tonight. But the power to persuade a man or a woman not depends upon all of those things. But in the end, though Jesus Christ has chosen you, you are going to have to make a choice concerning the choice Christ has made relative to your salvation. And I want to know how long is it going to take you to make up your mind when the issue is so clear, when the deductions are so certain, why are you taking so long and how long are you going to take? It's a very simple matter. Why do you sit here until you die? Why do you come service after service and fail to make a choice? Why do you come time after time and listen to the preaching and to the singing and fail to put a foot in the aisle? How long are you going to hang around before you begin to act on what you know? How long before you are going to exercise the good judgment in the matter of salvation that you are recognized for and everything else? There are some things that are debatable. There are some things you should take a lot of time looking at, but you've had sufficient time to look at the matter of salvation and eternal life and heaven and hell and right and wrong and your eternal destiny. These fellows outside the wall were playing spiritual ping pong. There were two fellows on one side and two fellows on the other side, and they were batting this, this problem back and forth day after day, and they were shooting it back and forth and cutting it back and forth, and, and uh, one day they were in favor of doing one thing, and the next day they are in favor of doing the other, but the vote was always two to two. And they could never come to a conclusion. Every day they got weaker. Every day they got more hungry. Every day the sun seemed to get hotter. Every day the environment seemed to militate against them. Every day, every day, everything seemed to keep going from bad to worse until at last one of those fellows cried out, Well, why do we sit here until we die? 
Why don't we do something? And my dear friend, you are better off to make a wrong decision than to sit around inactive and make no decision at all. You say, man, that's a dumb thing to say. It's not so dumb. If you make a wrong decision, it won't take you long to find out you've made a wrong decision. And there are some decisions that you can make in which the consequences aren't so bad, but you can turn around and recover. But here's a decision. If you put this thing off and put this thing off and you make no decision of all, no decision eventually becomes a decision. And friend, there are consequences associated with this no decision thing that will bring sad and eternal consequences to your soul. And now you folks are batting this thing about your spiritual welfare back and forth for a long time. You've been debating it. You know the pros and you know the cons. You know, uh, you know a little of what uh, God requires of you. You know a little of what it will mean to become a Christian. You also know what it will mean not to become a Christian. You know that hell is a reality. You know that there's a place of eternal fire. You know about all the sad consequences of people who have failed to take God's way. It's your prerogative. You can do as you please. You can bat the question around. But sooner or later, you're going to have to come to a decision. And in about the next 15 or 20 minutes, I want to talk to you about that decision. What are you waiting for? Are you waiting for a better dispensation or a better day or a better age or a better opportunity or a better sacrifice? There is no better age. There is no better day. There is no better dispensation. There is no better sacrifice than the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. This is the day. Now is the time. This is the time. Now is the day to repent. Now is the time to put your step, your foot forward and step out and do the thing that you know you're going to do. Well, when I, a little later, maybe on my deathbed, maybe when I'm 30, maybe when I'm 40, maybe when I'm 60, maybe when things sort of taper off, things are not going to taper off, things are not going to get better. This is the day. This today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your heart. While you're waiting, consider your influence. If you're a parent, consider the influence on your children. Consider what a bad influence is doing to your son, what an evil influence is doing to your daughter, what a wicked influence is doing to those that are around you. Consider your influence. No man lives to himself and no man dies to himself. And there are parents here tonight who are taking their children pell-mell down the escalator to hell. Because their influence is, is damnable, it's a reprobate influence, it is callous, it is evil, it is wicked, it is diabolical, and no matter how you garnish it, and no matter how you color it, and how lovely you may arrange it in the end, your influence is a negative influence upon them, and you are leading them in the wrong way. You don't have to encourage them that way. Just your own indecisiveness and your own evil life is sufficient to send them to hell. God help us. You need to consider your influence as a husband or as a wife. If you're here tonight, and basically you and I are influenced by others. We make choices on the basis of what somebody else does most of the time. You go to a revival meeting and you preach like this and uh, you go back through the congregation at the time of the invitation and there's a handsome hunk of a guy and here's a beautiful bomb of a gal and here's a couple little old kids on side saddle you know and one in somebody's arm and the gospel has come to them they've heard the truth they their their heart is stirred maybe they have a good background maybe they know something about it they may have praying parents i don't know all but you know uh, there she stands she weighs 97 pounds maybe 98 dripping wet and she looks up at him, and she's got this one little guy in her arm, her side saddle, and she's looking up at him. He's six foot two or three, black wavy hair, built like Atlas. He's a husky fellow. He's a powerful guy. He can inhale a chocolate pie, put down a peck of potatoes, drop a cement block on his toe, and shake it off with nothing. You know, he's a man, you know. So she married this beautiful, handsome hunk of whatever it is, and she looks up into his beautiful, bright blue eyes, or his lovely, luscious brown eyes, and in substance, she's saying, big boy, why don't we have a Christian home? Why don't we serve God? Uh, big boy, let's go tonight. Let's give our heart to Jesus. Let's raise our children for God and for heaven. Uh, let's answer mother's prayers. And, and let's do what God wants us to do. And uh, he looks down, dignified in a kingly fashion, and sort of 
shakes his head very slowly for the king is uh, the king is making up his mind you know and and her heart is going pity pat pity pat and she's really wants to serve god and really his is too but you know man that he is powerful fellow that he is he this religion bit is not for him after all it's for old women and grandmas and little skinny women like you but it really isn't for a man in a man's world where i live and so she looks up at him and and she uh, she gets her arm in his and she suggests he sort of trips down the aisle and come on and she can just tell the way he stands there that he's not going to do anything about it well, I have, some, I have advice for you, little lady. If you're sitting out there tonight, whether you're 98 or 198, I'm going to tell you what to do. After you've looked the Romeo in the eyes and after you've tried to get him to act sensible, if he won't pay any attention to you, I tell you what you do. You just take the little guy's side saddle and take the other one if you have to and come right down the mourner's bench. After all, he's got a streak of yellow as wide as my hand that runs from the back end of his head right on down to the tail end of his tailbone. He doesn't have the sand or the courage or the gumption. He's not really, you know, he's really afraid of the fussy little secretary that sits behind the desk at the place where he works, and he knows that she'll find out that he made the hit the sawdust trail, and he can't stand it. If he'd walk in and she'd say, well, big boy... Hi, Samson, I understand you hit the sawdust trail. He couldn't stand her little snicker or her little laugh. He sort of likes her just a little bit, you know, and he wants her to think that he's really a manly fellow, that he can pick up a, a sizable weight, and he's a powerful character. Or he's thinking about the fellows down at the cement mixer, or the guys on the construction job, or the fellows in the shop, that when he walks in, they'll all say, Hi, preacher boy. <laughs> Amen, amen. And he can't take that, and he, he's a chicken. Now, if some of you big overgrown brutes want to beat an old man 61 years up, come on, I'll take you on out here. It'll just show what a yellow-bellied, spineless character you really are. And girls, you listen to what I'm saying. You walk down that aisle. You bring the little old kids in your hand. Go home and set up a family altar. Pray the fire down. He'll rattle the dishes and bang the silverware around the table and make things as miserable as he can. But it just goes to, pro, goes to prove that he's a sissy, that he's got lace on his handkerchief, that he takes a bath in joy perfume and that he's just nothing but an overgrown elf and you almost made a mistake in marrying the character. Amen. Amen. You know something? Most of the men that are converted here tonight were converted after their wife was converted. If you were married, if you were married and unsaved when you were married, I'll guarantee not betting, but I'll guarantee you something. I'll guarantee that about 70% of the men that are saved tonight were saved after the little old gal had the intestinal fortitude, that's the Greek for guts, to step out and start serving God before you got around to it. Well, hallelujah, brother, that's the truth, and you know it so. How many others are in that category? Come on, boys, put your hands up. It takes a measure of courage to do even this, doesn't it? If you're any kind of a man at all, any kind, even a 155-pound hank of hair and rack of bones, you'll take the lead. You'll be the head of your house. You'll take the way with God. You'll set up a family altar. You won't wait for this little waif over here with two or three kids hanging around all day to take the spiritual lead. You'll be what you want to be and head out for the city of God and say, it's for me and my house we're going to serve the Lord. Is that right? While you're waiting, consider sin's effects on your body. See what's going to happen to your body. Consider effects upon, uh, sin's effects upon your body, upon your mind, upon your physical frame, upon your coordination, upon your appetites, upon your disposition. Consider these things. You can't live in a swill barrel. You can't 
fog your mind with dope and cigarettes. You can't fill your veins with that kind of poison there is in the world today. You can't immerse yourself in the wrong kind of a world and the wrong kind of sin and the wrong kind of perversion and the wrong kind of, of things. You can't find yourself taking a deep dive into alcohol and beer and, and uh, mixtures like that without having a devastating effect on what little brain you do have. I, I tell you, friends, I can't understand these poor people that are finding their way to the swill barren, filling their mind and filling their body with stuff that pickles their minds and retards their intellectual development, slows down their reflexes. When you sin, you reap the harvest in your own body. It has a devastating effect. Not only so, while you're waiting, consider the devil's strategy. You are taking time to debate something you already have the answer for. You have already reached the right and proper conclusion, but you're taking more time. And while you're taking the time, the devil is not asleep with his strategy. What's he doing? Well, I'm here to tell you, my dear friend, the devil is making sure that he gets you involved in more and more problems and more and more things. Every day you put off going on and serving God, you have another day to repent of. And every day you put it off, you give the devil ample opportunity to get you involved in sex or money or problems or bitterness or enmity or get your eyes fastened on a hypocrite or somebody else and give you just another excuse as to why you can't. When I was a young fellow, you know, I thought, well, when I get out of high school, it'll be easier serving God. Well, I got out of high school and it wasn't any... Well, when I get married, I'll have some of these problems that relate to young life. They'll be out of the way and it'll be easier serving God. But it wasn't. Well, when I get a church and then when I get ordained and then when I get this and when I get that, I'm here to tell you, my dear friend, every stage of life has its battle and every stage of life has its problem. And instead of finding that things get easier as you get gray hair and hardening of the arteries, things get more difficult as you pass down the road of life. And that's why it's wise for young people to seek the Lord. That's why young people, the, the percentage of, uh, and statistically, of young men and young women getting saved is a high statistic. And if you'll take a poll of the congregations across the country, you'll find out that those that have been serving God for 20 or 30 or 40 years started 20 or 30 or 40 years back there when they were teenagers. And the longer you put it off, the more you have to repent of. And the longer you put it off, the more you have, the less time you have to repent in and the devil's strategy is to get you messed up maritally or get you messed up financially or to get you messed up emotionally get you messed up intellectually and get you to wondering and try to handle all the problems and the intellectual and the theological and the emotional problems you'll have more problems than you know how to handle you'll never get your problem solved if you're waiting to have the problems of life solved before you give your heart to god you'll be a bundle you'll be a mess you'll make your way to a lost world you need to act on what you know you need to do like the fellow in the far country come to yourself and say i'm a fool over here i'll i'll rise i'll go to my father and i'll say i've sinned and i just want to be a servant and you'll find that the father is walking down the highway of life with arms of love and forgiveness stretched out in your direction you don't need to sit around here and die and perish you can make a choice you can make the right kind of decision. You can find your way into everlasting habitations. What are the effects of your inaction? Well, one effect of inaction is that your actually your desire dies. You get past feeling. You find yourself losing the interest, losing the appetite, losing the enthusiasm, losing the spiritual interest in spiritual things. Your mind is bewildered. You find out the longer you put it off, the more difficult it becomes to make a decision of any kind. The longer you put it off, not only this, but anything else, it's a sound psychological principle that the thing that you put off becomes more difficult as you continue to put it off. And every day you put the thing off, the more...
holiness churches across the country and they've heard preaching again and again and every time you push it away every time you push it aside every time you bat the proposition back maybe tomorrow it'll be better the next time it'll be easier the next time maybe this will happen maybe my wife will get the notion maybe my husband will get the notion maybe this and maybe that and the maybes always hatch into a cockatrice's den and never develop into anything good the maybes only produce more problems the thing for you to do my dear friend is to face the problem squarely and then step out and mind god there will be certain problems naturally that will come from the decision you make when these fellows decided we will show ourselves to the syrians i'm not trying to tell you there's no problems in serving god i'm not going to tell you that everything's going to fall into place but i can tell you one thing if you make the choice and you you hear the voice of jesus christ crying tonight I have chosen you. You have not chosen me. But I accept the choice that you have made for me, Jesus. And you make that step. I'm here to tell you that God in heaven will begin to move in your direction. Amen. These fellows here knew the situation was bad. They knew the people in the city were not going to open the doors. They knew there was only one thing to do. They didn't have a ladder to climb over. If they got inside, they were starving in there. So there was no use going that way. But over here, two mile away, three mile away, was the Syrians. And there was their, their tents and their armies and their horses. And they had all that the heart could wish, all kinds of food to eat and goat's milk and other milk to drink. They had everything a party would wish. And so they said, well, there's only one way to go. Let's go there. And the worst they can do is to kill us. And so they moved in that direction. As they moved in that direction, God in heaven did something for them that they didn't know God was doing. The Syrians heard a sound. They heard a noise. They thought they heard horses. They thought they heard chariots. They thought they heard a lot of things. And behold, they said they've hired the Hittites against us. Let's get out of here. And they fled their encampment. And as they fled their encampment, they left their food and their wine and their drink and their cheese and their bread and their cakes, everything in the tent just where they were. Struggling across the desert come these four leprous fellows. Maybe one has a, a, a limb missing. His leg is missing. His arm is missing. Another, his face is partially eaten away. But somehow or other, we all hang on to life, no matter what kind of a life it is. And they've made a choice. As they came to the border of the camp, they no doubt came with fear and trepidation and great anxiety. They didn't know what moment someone would curse. They didn't cry, unclean, unclean. They tried to sneak in. They didn't know at what moment someone would strike them with a club or thrust them through with a spear or cut them with a sword. But they came to a tent and they slipped inside. And inside there was, lo and behold, there was nothing and nobody there. There. They saw the food. They devoured food. They looked about. They heard no noise. They went from tent to tent. They gorged themselves. They filled themselves. They had all that a heart could wish. You see, God had moved on their behalf. I'm not here to tell you that if you make the decision for God, everything is going to go smooth, but I'll tell you this, that God will go ahead of you if you've got restitutions and confessions and apologies and rectifications to make, no matter what they may be. I give you, on the basis of the Word of God, all the resources of heaven will be brought to bear upon your problems and your difficulty, and God will move in your direction, and God will help you take care of them. There are young people here tonight that have some very, very serious problems. There are some young fellows here tonight that are on dope and they're hooked on alcohol and some other things and you don't know how in the world you're going to get out of it. Your mother doesn't know about it. Your father doesn't know about it. But you know you've got yourself in a mess. You've acted the part of a thief. You've stolen guns or cameras or, or uh, other things you could get your hand on to keep your habit going. You'd like to break loose, but you don't want the gang to know it. You'd like to cut out of there, but you don't know what the consequences would be. How will I ever get out of this mess? I don't know how you're going to get out of the mess, but I'm here to tell you that if you'll make the step, if you'll break, if you'll confess, if you'll run to Jesus Christ, the resources of heaven will be at your command to help you break to help you go clean. And there's 101 witnesses that will stand at a word here tonight and say, I found it so. Yeah. Amen. If you found it so, stand up. I, if you found it, God, stand up. You see that? You see that? Amen. Amen. The devil doesn't like that. He told every last one of us there was no way out. You may be seated. 
My dear friend, there are standing witnesses and evidence is the power of God to get you out of the mess you're in. You don't need to sit around here and die. You don't need to bat this thing back and forth and back and forth and wonder what's going to happen. If you make your choice, Christ has made his. If you make your choice and set your foot in that aisle and say, as for me, I'm going to serve God, you'll hear the noise of chariots. You'll hear a rustling in the mulberry bush. You'll find the resources of God moving in your direction. You can leave here at change man. I'm not going to tell you everything's going to be bright and rosy tomorrow, but I'm going to tell you the resources of God will be with you, enabling you to live a victorious life and live above sin. You can have a new pattern. You can live a new life. You can break the old pattern. There's no doubt a girl here tonight, perhaps pregnant out of wedlock. She's got problems. She doesn't know what to do. She's scared to death to have an abortion. Thank God for that. Also, but she's puzzling over 101 other problems. How will I handle this? How will I get out of this mess? Where will I go? Shall I move to a distant city? I don't know what to tell you. That's not the thing to do. Don't run from your problem. Run to Jesus Christ and there place your case and tell him about it. I know this. God will help you through this thing. He's helped others. He'll bring you out even as he brought Rahab the harlot out. You hang out the golden cord. You hang out the ruby red and scarlet thread and acknowledge Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life and you'll find the resources of heaven are at your disposal. While you're waiting, how long shall I wait? And I'm concluding. How long shall I wait, Brother Smoove? It's not how long shall you wait. How long are you going to wait? How long are you going to wait? Some of you have already waited 40 years. Some of you have waited 20 years. Some have waited 5 years and 10 years. You've waited too long already. If you're not saved tonight, you've already waited longer than you ought. You don't have to wait another stroke of the clock. You don't have to wait another tick of the, of, the, of the watch. You need to walk in the light and start out right away. Are you going to wait? How long will you wait? Maybe you'll wait till tragedy comes. Maybe you'll wait till sorrows roll over your head like a sea billow. Maybe you're going to wait until some disaster comes in your family. Some people do. A few years ago when I was at Frankfurt Pilgrim Camp in that lovely new tabernacle, 100 feet wide and 200 feet long, you had to have Boy Scouts to go back there and locate the, the seekers and show them the way to the mourner's bench. It was so far from one end to the other. The la one of the latter nights of that meeting, we had a fabulous altar service. The whole place turned into an altar. I walked down, like going down that stair there. Just as I started down the stair, I looked lest I fall. I almost did the other night. I looked lest I fall. As I looked down, I saw the strangest thing I'd seen, I had ever seen that was supposed to pass for a head. Here was a head that looked like it had been through somebody's mammoth waffle iron. And there were springs of hair springing up this way and that way and, and every other way. And as I tried to steady myself on the fellow's shoulder so I could walk down, the thing that was supposed to be a face looked up in my direction. One eye was gone. It was a horrible looking socket or where, a so where an eye had been. And uh, he looked up in my face and uh, he said, Brother, look at me. Well, I tell you, I saw enough already to make me sick, but I did as I was commanded. I looked at him. The face, the face also had been gone through a horrible and hideous experience of one kind or another. And then as I was looking at him, he held up a hand. Uh, that is what was left of a hand. And there was one finger. Everything was gone from here. The thumb was gone and this was gone. And he had one finger and he was pointing it up like that. He said, look at me, brother, look at me. And I looked at him. It took all the courage I had. I looked at what was the remains of what was a man. The other sleeve was empty altogether. He said, look at me, brother, look at me. I said, I am looking at you, sir. He said, do you see what I am? I said, I do, sir. He said, I thank God for what I am. He said, three years ago, he said, I was in this camp meeting, and David Denton from Tennessee was the preacher. He said, my mother wept and prayed and fasted most of the time. Said, I was, uh, I saw, last night at the camp meeting, I stood outside and my mother went out and came to me and begged me to come to the altar. But she said, I wasn't interested. I was a man. I worked for the power company. I climbed the poles. I drove the trucks. I was a he-man and religion was for when I got older for people like my mother. But he said less than three weeks later, and he went on to tell about a horrible accident that took place in the midst of a storm and a high voltage line, and he was almost incinerated. 
I'll never forget his words. He said, I thank God for what's happened to me, preacher. I thank God. I said, oh, my God, thank God for that. Yes, he said, I thank God for this because he said, that sealed my destiny. I settled it in my heart while I was in that old hospital for almost two years. I got things straight, and I'd rather go to heaven maimed as I am than to go to hell the way I was. I thank God, preacher. And he said, as you go around the country, tell them about this horrible mess that I am and warn them away. Well, I'm here to tell you this, my friend. You don't have to wait until tragedy strikes to sort of get your attention. You don't have to wait until disaster takes something away from you, a son or a daughter or a husband or a wife or a financial fiasco. My dear friend, you don't. You're a fool if you do. Act on what you know. How long am I going to wait? Are you going to wait until the Holy Ghost leaves you to yourself and departs from you? This is the sad thing that happened to poor old Saul. Saul who rejected Christ, rejected God and the overtures of mercy. Saul who spurned the intercessory prayers of the good old prophet Samuel who pushed him aside. Samuel acted as his father, his prophet, his mentor, his helper, but he spurned them all aside. But you know the sad end of poor Saul Saul came down to the end of days and he said, I played the fool. And he said, God doesn't answer me anymore. And Saul did play the fool. He said, I've erred exceedingly. And there are people all across the country who are making the sad and tragic error. They played the fool. God has departed from me. That's a terrible word. That's an awful sentence. That's a fearful asthma to fall from the lips of a man who had all the golden opportunity, but that's exactly what happens. Sad to say, my dear friend, you don't have to wait until you played the fool. You don't have to wait until you make such a tragic error. You can act intelligently. He said, I have erred. It's an error for you to sit there. It's an error for you to continue to debate. It's an error for you to put it off another day. It's Act on what you know, not on what you feel. It's an error for you to debate the thing any farther. You know that the two ways are set before you, a way of life, a way of death, a way of light, a way of darkness, a way of salvation, a way of damnation, a way of heaven, a way of hell. It's as plain as that. It's as simple as that. You don't need to further adjudicate the issue. You don't need to judiciously study anything farther. You'll never have some little problem settled in your mind, but God is here tonight. Don't err. Don't err exceedingly. Act on what you know. This is a very straightforward gospel message, but I have a feeling in my heart that there's some people here that are sitting in death row. You know what death row is? Death row is that place in the penitentiaries where people spend their time before they're taken to the chair. I have a feeling tonight that there are people sitting in a spiritual death row, that if some of you don't make up your mind, that you don't make a decision, you don't step out and start minding God, this could be your death row. This could be your last opportunity. You'll you hear that all, oh yeah, we hear that all. I know you hear it all the time, but it's still true whether you hear it or not. If you think I'm missing the boat, talk to your metropolitan insurance man or talk to the prudential fellow. And uh, sometimes they can bring a greater solemnity in our little old house than the preacher with his evangelistic messages can bring because they bring out the tables and they show us what can happen and they make you feel rather solemn about this business of living in this world. But you're a fool, and I say this carefully, you're a fool You are if you're gambling with your soul. You're a fool. You can gamble with money. You can gamble with your health. You might recover your health. You might recover money. But if you lose your money, you lose your health, you but health, you but die. But if you lose your soul, you're lost eternally. You're lost forever. None of us have any guarantee of tomorrow. There's but a step between me and death. Your time is short and my time is short. And before you come around to the new campground and the new camp meeting, there'll be other books that are out about young people or young men. There may be, well be, or some that are not so young who have gone off into eternity either by the way of the swimming pool or a telephone pole or some gun accident or some other crazy thing or disease and who knows what's working in this crowd tonight who knows what disease or sorrow or tragedy or heartache is potential in this congregation nobody knows but God knows 
You should act wisely and carefully. I'm going to ask us to stand and sing number 121. I want everybody to sing. I want everybody to mind God. I have a feeling there are people out here in the dark. I had that as I walked across the grounds tonight and sat down in a chair. I bowed my head to pray, and as I was praying, I thought, Oh, God, oh, God, who is it right here in this area outside this building? They think they're safe. They think they'll never be touched by this message. But, oh, God, I had a feeling there's somebody outside this building on the outside that was hearing the call of God. Why don't you walk in from the shadows and find your way at this altar? If you're here tonight, walk in from the outside or from the back of the building. If you're unsaved, you have a spiritual need. We're not going to sing long. It's a hot night, but it's a good time to get saved. And nobody's any hotter than I am. Nobody's tried any harder than I've tried, but you can get saved. This hot Saturday night in June can be the turning point. Why sit here until you die? Why err until you go to hell? Come on, let's mind God while we sing. Oh, step right out. Will you step right out and open this altar? You move, that's right. Thank God for that young man. It's going to take some courage to do it, but step right out. Come on, from the outside, from the inside. Obey God tonight. You have a spiritual need. Let's be here. Come on, while we sing. Hurry. Hurry, come on, while God is talking, while the Spirit is dealing. Second verse, we're singing the second verse, are you minding God? Are you coming? 